technically homeless. I used to live here. I was staying with a friend of mine. Um, we were pushed out of this building, increasing rent rates, and the landlord just decided that he was not renewing leases, get out in 30 days. She kept saying, why can't we go back home? What's going on? But I just explained to her that home is family. As long as we're together, you're home. These days, I'm hearing there are more homeless people in New York City than at any time since the Great Depression. A record 60,000 in the city's shelter system, including 23,000 children. I can't fucking believe it. The homeless are a city within a city. Many got that way simply because they can't afford to live here. Today, there isn't a single neighborhood in the five boroughs where someone working full time on the state's minimum wage can afford the average rent. The problem is our income is too low for private developments, too high for city housing. Why don't you take a cut in wages and move into the slums? <laughs> Back in the 70s, I tried using humor to call attention to some things that were plaguing America. New York was my canvas. Now, I'm back here on a mission to find out what's changed, how tough the struggle for a home can still be, and what we can do about it. Did we invest in those communities? No, instead we declared war. What we have today is a wealth gap that is huge. We are dying with untreatable water. The working class have been hammered. These are human beings, these are people. What can we do to get that point across? We're not doing enough. It's causing us to explode. It is not, sir, a matter of opinion anymore. It is clearly exposed. It's clearly exposed. What do we do? Stand up right now. They can only win by dividing America. Dividing America. We, we know that the way things are working aren't working at all. That's right. If you just keep pushing, if you just keep trying, if you refuse to let the nightmares have the last say, eventually the dawn will break, the sun will come out, and you will be in a brand new day. If there's no struggle, there can be no progress. How are you? Oh, how are you? I'm thrilled to introduce you to Norman Lear, Jenny oh, Lenz. So nice to meet you. Good to meet you also. This is the place. Twenty-three million dollars. You'll see why in a second. It was all redone. It's all beautiful marble floors, gold leaf on the ceiling. We have four bedrooms and a library. Uh -huh. You see the George Washington Bridge. You see the Palisades. The views here are fairly protected. On the current zoning, they can never be changed. Mm -hmm. And the plaza, which is better to look down on than be in. <laughs> this is Dolly Lenz and her daughter Jenny. Dolly grew up poor in the Bronx. Her dad was a factory worker, and now she's one of Manhattan's top real estate brokers. When I started 30 years ago, my clients were mostly doctors and lawyers. Today, my clients are centimillionaires, billionaires. It changed dramatically because the complexion of the city in that period changed dramatically. I was reading about some extremely expensive apartments that stay empty. We're going to see a hell of a view here, I suspect. In this building, 
it's almost exclusively foreigners. So they're buying a $90 million apartment, literally, a $100 million apartment, a $53 million apartment. They're from China, they're from every part of the world, and they're looking at it as a safety deposit box. How can I get money out of my country into a safety deposit box here? They're sold. Yes. They're occupied. Yes. Well, they're sold. And they stay empty 90% of the time. Yes. This situation is depriving people of places to live where average people used to live. I, I think it's, it's a disaster. And I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. How do you save the money for the down payment? You know, when the average price of a one bedroom is in excess of a million dollars, it's a one bedroom, it's not a family. See, I felt 30 years ago I had a chance, right? I don't feel that young people have the feeling to have that chance. But this is America. Equal opportunity. What do you mean there isn't a chance? There isn't a chance for upward mobility the way there was for my generation. We can talk about it, but it doesn't exist. Since the middle class is being forced out of Manhattan, landlords in the outer boroughs have plans to capitalize. The noise can be unsettling, as you can hear, and the raise my voice is louder. I don't want to stay out here too long. Okay. Yeah. You should ask them to secure your door. Okay. And when the children come home. Yeah, because they're talking loud now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I hear them coughing. Don't let them come out. If you don't like it, you can move. If it's too much noise, you can move. This dust didn't cause it. We're not working that long. Uh, so whatever you're going through is not because of us. Mm. They care nothing about my life. The only thing they want to do is get three times as much money for this apartment that I'm paying now. They care about their construction. I care about my life. This is uh, one of the buildings that's on my worst landlord list. He, unfortunately, is um, engaging in tactics which amount to harassment of tenants. He claims that he's renovating the building, but he's renovating the buildings uh, in violation of the law. He's doing the work without permits. There's dust, there's debris, there's rodents. Well, why is he doing that? Because he wants them out. He wants to raise the rents. But these people wish to stay where they are and they have leases. That's right. And he's creating hostile conditions so that some of them just give up and move out. And he is displacing those residents who happen to be black. He will be replacing them with individuals who can pay the rent, who in all likelihood, in all likelihood are, are white. All right. I guess I am not old enough to understand how a man can be breaking the law so thoroughly and not be arrested or had not stopped from doing it. Most landlords just pay the fines. It's the cost of doing business. So is the next stop for some of these people homelessness? Some of them will wind up in our shelters. Some of them will wind up with their families doubled and tripled up. Oh, my goodness. And I know landlords are going to say, you know, it's just not fair. You purchase a piece of real estate, in the free enterprise system, you have every right to do what you do. Exactly. Doing. The question is process. Uh, are you engaging in illegal activity? And are you doing it in a way that disproportionately affects people of color? I've lived here for 38 years, me and my mom. <laughs> my name is Gertrude Diffler. I moved here in the 60s. I don't remember, you know, the exact year. My name is Judy Lewis. We lived here since 1973. My name is Pernella Rathwit, and I'm living here 38 years now. My name is Norman Lear, and I've been in this building, oh, about 20 minutes. <laughs> 
In 2014, that cold winter, they renovated the apartment next door to me and the one above me. No walls, no ceilings, no floors, no windows. And it was 10 degrees outside and we had no heat and hot water. Those are the taxes that they use to displace you. A lot of people in here who are sick. Yeah. All this dust and everything, I have to keep the windows down. And the noise is mind boggling. It makes you want to scream. I brought it all to the attention of the man lord and his agent, and nothing has been done. He looks at me and asks me, do I want to move? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's bullying and harassment. He not only asked me once, but he's asked me three times, and I told him, do not ask me anymore. There's no respect. I want you out because you, your rent is low. You pay $1,000, I can get $2,500 for that apartment. I'm gonna make your life miserable. My concern is not only for myself, but it's for the seniors in here. It's for the people who are sick in here, people who are on pensions and social security in here. We were here during the crack epidemic. We were here when the Crown Heights riots. We looked out for this building, but who's gonna look out for us now? Most holy and gracious God, source of compassion, source of justice, we invoke your holy presence here this morning on behalf of all those struggling to obtain truly affordable housing. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! What do we want? When do we want it? Now! Get up! Get down! I have a sense of gentrification, but if I were asked to explain it, I couldn't. How do you explain it? I think everyone can agree on a definition of what gentrification is. Um, what people can't agree on is whether or not the changes that occur in a neighborhood that's gentrifying are good or bad, and what is causing them. To us, we believe that gentrification is caused by landlords and bankers and real estate speculators working together to drive up the cost of housing. Today I'm hanging out with Sia Weaver, one of a new breed of housing activists who are contending with the new faceless breed of landlords. We see private equity companies who are buying rent-stabilized buildings in Crown Heights. They're not thinking about the people who want to live in New York City, they're thinking about parking money here. Yes, yes. I mean, landlords are buying buildings for profit and profit alone. A private equity landlord is backed by investors. They want huge returns and in a short period of time. You know, you think of a landlord that's somebody who you can call to get your ceiling fixed or who's going to help you get your apartment painted or help you get a new apartment if you're trying to move. You know, landlords like that are rarer and rarer in New York City. Sia wants to show me what all of this looks like from a tenant's perspective. And she takes me out to Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm Natasha. Hi, I'm Norman. It's okay. good to meet you. Good to meet you. Hey, everybody. Hi, how are you? What's your name? Hi, Aaliyah. Hi, Aaliyah. And you? My name is Rondo. I am Norman. All of these guys were born here. Yes, all of them has been, yes. It was like 200 and something dollars when we started to play right here. Uh -huh. And now, I pay $9.92. And now he wants to do what? Now he want to raise it to $21.39. He wants to go from $900 to $2,100 mm -hmm. in one leap. Mm -hmm. And his reason? He said Crown Heights is in New Manhattan. Can you just afford the $2,100? No, I cannot afford the $2,100. I have a 19-year-old in college. I'm self-employed. My head goes immediately to your little one there. <laughs> Oh. You know, a, a world that treats her fairly. If I sit back and allow him to do what he do to me, what was going to happen to them when they get older? Where are they going to live? Mm -hmm. Sia tells me none of this would be happening if big corporations weren't taking over so many residential buildings in poor neighborhoods and expecting such high returns. I need to talk to someone who's on the inside of that. Show me 
what's going on? Brooklyn is crazy hot. There's a huge wave of new people coming here. Bushwick, East Wilmersburg, Crown Heights, those areas definitely are full of people who are young, uh, creators, etc., etc. Brooklyn was a blue collar borough. There's no doubt about it. It's no longer the case. Brooklyn is a brand, it's the new Manhattan. Hello, how are you? <laughs> nice to meet you. Likewise. Here we have some of our projects. We have 47 projects in Brooklyn. We build over 47 projects. 47 projects. Over a thousand units. I have uh, German pension funds uh, speaking with us about investments, and uh, uh, I'm originally from Israel. Israeli funds are investing uh, in Brooklyn. You're a foreign investor. Mm -hmm. What return do you have to promise them? Uh, promise is a difficult word to use in, in economics, but um, we're looking at 20% in North annual return to the investors. Well, now that's a figure that I've heard in a couple of other situations where the landlords are working as hard as I can to evict. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I know that world because I'm in real estate. Uh, the economical p pressure on the system and the lack of uh, housing available in New York City in general right. causes people to be aggressive about uh, vacancies and do illegal things. We don't do that. Listen, there's many ways to make money and you have to put your head on the pillow at the end of the day and see if you feel comfortable with what you did. I'm not trying to protect that industry. Um, people who do it not by law, okay? Uh, but when you have international money, when you have a lot of big corporation investing in those areas, their job, they could care less about what you do to get those returns. They want as high a return as possible. I think of it in the most simplistic terms. Those people who are working hard for a living, who are never going to make more than a modest living wage. Yes. You know, they're good people, they're mm -hmm. raising kids, they have to get their kids educated and so forth. Why can't there be enough affordable housing for those people who are going to work here and service those people who can more than afford to live here? The reality of life is that financial forces think short term. They want to make money. If I'm selling an apartment for $800,000, okay, which is the kind of prices I'm selling between $500,000 to $800,000 apartment, and I'm now selling it for $150,000 to affordable. Someone has to pay for the gap. Someone has to pay for the cost of my construction, for the cost of my, uh, my land. So if I don't have a financial uh, uh, incentive to sell the apartment for $150,000, why, would I, why would, would I do that? You know, just from you know, the kindness of my heart, yes, we could do it once or twice, but not as a business plan. So if it's not a business plan, who's going to offer developers and landlords the incentive to build affordable housing? Brothers and sisters, hermanos y hermanas, we did it. We now have a law, a law that says Real estate developers can do their work and build their buildings, but whenever they come to the city, you have to guarantee us affordable housing. Bill de Blasio's plan to allow new building but require affordable housing sounds reasonable to me. But I hear it's very controversial. So before I go interview the mayor, I'm sitting down with a few housing activists to see what they think. We have a saying in the tenant movement, real estate in New York is like oil in Texas. Anyone who loves this city has to see that the experience of gentrification is changing what it means to be a New Yorker, changing what New York is. And a lot of us are very committed to stopping that and to instituting a different vision of what we could be doing in this city. That's Sam Stein, an activist and academic who researches housing issues at the City University of New York. Oh, hi, Michelle. Uh, hello. Michelle Neugebauer runs a housing nonprofit in one of Brooklyn's poorest neighborhoods. 
they try to buy properties to devote to affordable housing before the private equity firms could get them. Guess what the subject was? Gentrification? Yeah. How about ethnic no. cleansing? Is that too strong of a statement? <laughs> ethnic cleansing? It's a little powerful and people often will tie it to killing and murder. In a way it is, you're killing off people's lifetimes. And I, exactly, displacement has an effect, a long-term effect that people don't often think about. That's Rob Robinson. His ideas may sound extreme, but he says they're based on lived experience. Years ago, he tells us, he was living in Florida, had a long-term desk job, when he was suddenly let go. He ended up on the streets for years. Do you have a guess as to how many there are like it? In New York City alone, probably about 20,000 people oh who God. have a work history, capable of working, but the, the economic situation makes it difficult. We have a self-professed progressive mayor um, who has been able to accomplish a lot of things, and yet when it comes to housing, we haven't had a fresh approach that really takes the fundamental right to housing seriously. Mayor de Blasio's housing plan is not exactly what it sounds like. But more good than bad. I don't know. More the same than different. We talked a long time. They threw around a bunch of numbers. In a nutshell, they say the affordable housing in the mayor's plan is simply not affordable to most people living in the poor neighborhoods where the plan is being launched. We think the housing should match the incomes of the people that live in the neighborhood now. The mayor sees what you see. Would he, if he were sitting here, just tell you he doesn't agree with you? I think he thinks that by building more affordable housing, regardless of who it's affordable for, that's going to solve gentrification. And you're saying in, in, a, in response to that? You're wrong. <laughs> you're, you're wrong. It's going to increase gentrification. Wow. Sometimes we have to look in the mirror, I don't care who we are, and reflect about what we're doing, how we live, are we living by principles and values, right? That values community and other people and all people. We should all be working on changing people's values and people's minds, but policy is often where, where it starts and what drives it. So part of our problem, Norman, is political will. You met my wife, Charlene, back in Los Angeles. Hi, yes, few yes, years yes, back. yes. Hi, it's good to see good you see again. Hello. again. Hello. Oh, we can do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a free can. country. <laughs> How are you, sir? So good to see you. When an American icon's at City Hall, we stop everything. Oh. Yeah. So you call him. <laughs> <laughs> right. So my interest is uh, discussing housing. Yes. The homeless. Yeah. I mean, I understand there are some 60,000 people homeless. Almost. And 23,000 of them are children. Yeah. Even as late as 2002, folks in our homeless shelters were primarily single individuals. Today, the typical shelter resident is a member of a family with something very specific to do each day. It's a child who goes to school or it's someone who goes off to work, sadly, typically to a low-wage job. But they cannot afford better than a, a shelter. And what's happened, one part because of the recession, you know, knocking so many people out economically, but also because of gentrification. You don't want that. It's not that I don't want it. Gentrification is a double-edged sword. With it comes a lot of investment in communities and in many ways uh, improvements in a lot of the things that are in those communities, but at the same time, way too much displacement and upsetting of the opportunities for folks who have been in the community for a long time right. uh, so, overcharging. And what do you do? What have you done about it? We that? have passed a law requiring developers to create affordable housing. If they don't create affordable housing, they do not get a permit to build. But there's is, also an organization, or, or perhaps a couple of organizations, that feel the rezoning that uh, you are, your administration is responsible for is resulting in gentrification. If you've got to supply a housing that because of the free market is becoming less and less accessible, you can subsidize some to keep it affordable for people, right. but you've got to build new housing too. It, but is your plan really going to open up the door to speculation? That's the bottom line. Speculation is going to happen one way or another. I fundamentally believe that. Anyone who thinks there are neighborhoods that will be untouched by change is kidding themselves. So there are some who almost, I think, suggest 
better to leave a neighborhood in tough shape than to take the risk of development. I argue that's not fair to the residents of those neighborhoods. We can put stronger rules into the process. We can put more requirements for affordable housing into the process. We can put government investment and subsidies into the process. That's how we create some balance and fairness in the equation. It's the best shot we've got. So, Mr. Jefferson, if you want the loan, you'll just have to locate your store in a more respectable neighborhood. Oh, you mean like a white neighborhood? That's a thought. <laughs> Back in the 70s, our shows reflected what I felt was a national consensus that race relations needed to be discussed. But boy is a white racist word. Michael. And solved. Whereas we got our fair share of colors in this street. Get out of here. What? It's a petition. It ain't a petition. It's a letter from the people who live in this street. To who? To some people that we don't want living in this street. Oh, Arch, what do you want to start this thing up for again? Oh, Daddy, isn't it a little late? The Jeffersons have been living here for over two years. This letter ain't got nothing to do with the Jeffersons. The Jeffersons are different. Why are the Jeffersons different? Because one college family is a novelty and two is a ghetto. What? <laughs> These days, as I meet people living on the edge, I can't help but notice that just about all of them are people of color. Why has so little changed in America? Is skin color still destiny? I've come to see someone who spent years studying this question. I really first got interested in segregation as a young child when I started getting bused from a black neighborhood in Waterloo, Iowa to go to white schools across the other side of town. It became very clear to me that people were living in very different types of neighborhoods and often that corresponded with their race. But when people have the chance to live in integrated neighborhoods, people do see that we're all pretty much the same and we all pretty much want the same things. The problem is in this country, it's so rare that we get that opportunity and especially in cities like New York. When I think about segregation, it's in the South. Believe it or not, when it comes to housing segregation, the North is worse than the South. New York City is actually the third most segregated city in the country. All of the most segregated cities Could in the country are in the and North. New York City is the third yes. most segregated city in the yes. country. Yes. In the 1930s, we had the Great Depression, and the federal government decides that it's going to build the middle class by insuring federal loans for homes. It took a map of a city, and the government decided that neighborhoods that were white got the best ratings, and neighborhoods that were integrated or mixed got a lesser rating, and neighborhoods that were black got the worst rating. And those neighborhoods were literally outlined in red marker, redlining. For the first 30 years, black Americans were almost entirely excluded. 98% of those loans went to white Americans. But we saw the largest expansion of the white middle class in the history of our country. And all of that wealth mostly was coming from housing. And so what we have today is a wealth gap that is huge. The average or median wealth of a white family is 140,000, and the median wealth of a black family is 7,000. 140. To 7,000. If I'm a young white kid and I'm going to college, I don't have to take out a student loan because my parents have wealth in their house that they can take out to help me get through college. If I'm a young black kid, more likely I'm going to have to take out a loan to go to college. And in fact, we know black Americans are the most likely to take out loans and also take out the largest loan amount, even though they have the least wealth to pay it back. Then I'm the white kid and I graduate and I go into teaching and maybe I'm making $35,000 a year, but my parents can give me a down payment to buy into a good neighborhood. The black kid's gonna have to make it on his own. Same income, but isn't going to be able to buy into that good neighborhood. You just either pass on your privilege or your disadvantage to the next generation. It must be so hard for Americans listening to this to believe their government could behave that way. I'd it's say it's hard for white Americans. I think for black Americans, it's very easy to believe that our government behaves this yeah. way. And then you have this myth that if a lot of black people move into a neighborhood, the property values go down. That's actually true. It's true, though, because of the way the federal government rated integrated neighborhoods. But we've come to believe it's true because black people just don't keep up their properties. So you see the way that a reality um, can be fueled by a myth. Reality can be fueled by a myth. Yes, absolutely. And is our government doing anything about that? Well, we have fair housing laws now. We don't have fair housing yet.
I don't think we realized how much effort went into creating segregation. We had cooperation from individual homeowners all the way up to the federal government to reorder our society in a way that harmed Black Americans and helped white Americans. So you have to break it up. You have to do what you did to create it. To end segregation, you have to break it up. I agree. But how can you fight something that's so widespread and so subtle? When you ask about an apartment, mm -hmm. you're looking for a one bedroom. So if he offers a studio, that's too small. If he offers a bigger size unit, it's probably going to be too expensive, so mm. you're sticking with a one bedroom. So when when is an apartment available price range in your apartment? Make forty one thousand a year. My wife, Suzanne, makes twenty nine thousand. I've been at my job for four years. She's been at a job for six. Remember my phone number. Yes, remember your phone number. <laughs> yeah. It's not unlike many others you've done in the past. My name is Roger White. Roger Sean. Oh, the, oh, the white means I'm white. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Roger Sean. My wife's name is Mona. She works at Cavalry Hospital. And we're looking for thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars one bedroom. We're doing that because my wife would love to be a little closer to where she works. She's now thirty years old. <laughs> Fred Freiberg's group is an investigative outfit that hires actors to pretend they're searching for apartments. Today, that's what I'm doing. I'll be carrying a hidden camera to find out whether a landlord racially discriminates. Will the landlord tell one thing to me and another to LB? If the landlord treats us differently, Fred Center intends to sue him. We did test a number of buildings in the neighborhood you're going to and found this one was, in fact, discriminating based on race. Your organization has been in business for 11 years, and you've sued often, I understand. We do sue often uh, when we find discrimination we have not uh, lost a case. But why, why, why are you do? I mean, you're well, exceedingly white. It, it, <laughs> um, yes, and, and I, but I realize the harm that comes to everybody, including white people in the society and living in a segregated society. I know I was greatly impaired uh, growing up in a segregated white neighborhood, going to segregated white schools, not having contact with people of other races and cultures impaired my ability to function now in a more multiracial society. It's L.B. Williams tagging in as Lawrence Williams. So that is record. Is the camera? Yeah, this is the camera. That's what I'm The camera's right there. Oh so when it fits in your pocket. Uh-huh, right. And that, yeah, it's perfect. Fair Housing Justice Center is a nonprofit civil rights organization based here in New York City. What we did this past week here in New York is to test in a predominantly white neighborhood and sent uh, LB Williams and Norman Lear. And we actually have an audio and video account of what occurred uh, during these visits. So this is LB's recording. Hi. Hi. Are you the landlord? My wife and I are looking for a one-bedroom apartment. Last month I rented one, two months ago I rented two. Okay. At the moment I have no vacancies here. Okay, no vacancies? No, at the moment. Okay, uh, when do you think you have one that, that would be available? One bedroom I don't expect, two bedroom I don't expect. Maybe a studio, maybe uh, the next month. Okay. He clearly said there was no one bedroom available. Uh, 
clearly. He said it several times. So this was um, basically Tuesday night, and then Wednesday morning, you visited the same landlord. Hey, how you doing? Hey, my wife was out here the other day. And I guess she, I guess she saw that sign. So. Yeah. Uh, we were looking for a one-room bedroom apartment. I'm going to have a studio here, and I have one bedroom in Pelham Bay. Uh huh. I think I know where that is. And, and the Probably studio the here. Room. Studio. I'm going to have end of the month here. Uh huh. Terrific. Okay. I thank you very much, sir. You got told about a studio apartment in that building and that was a, coming a, available. A one-bedroom apartment was available, which he's willing to show me, and a studio. Yeah, and the one-bedroom, according to the recording, is in uh, Pelham right. Bay on, on uh, Wellman Avenue, another right. predominantly white and last neighborhood. night, the way uh, LB was treated, was that a surprise to you? No, it was not, because we had previously investigated this building and done multiple uh, African-American white tests at this building and the exact conduct that we observed on your test we observed three additional previous times the way this housing provider does business is to discriminate against african americans no it's not against the law it is so why hasn't something been done about it? well i think part of it goes to this issue of the type of discrimination it is if lb had been a bona fide apartment seeker he would have had no idea that the agent was lying to him about availabilities. So you'd have no inclination to file a housing discrimination complaint. So well, everything we're talking about, how, how, how pervasive is this? I think it still accounts for much of the segregation that we see in our metropolitan regions. It's, it's one of the prominent factors, I think, in why we don't move more quickly toward a more integrated society. I think people of color carry additional baggage through no fault of our own, um, that other people, people, that white people don't worry about, essentially. There's this issue that you always have to be aware of, that someone is going to look at you differently, than, not for what you are, essentially, but for what you look like. It always saddens me. It consistently says to me, as an African-American, that I'm less than. And that's a horrible feeling to, to, uh, to feel. You deserve a lot of credit for doing this. I feel like I have to, you know, it's, it's, it's my way of making a difference. I think hopefully shining a light on the problem in this forum by bringing the lawsuits that we subsequently will in response to these situations uh, will show the government that it is possible to uncover this discriminatory conduct, but you've got to devote the enforcement resources to do it. We spoke yesterday. I stopped by. I was looking for an apartment, that one-bedroom apartment. My, my wife had seen the sign. Can we make a date to uh, look at that? We, we're interested. The time has come to confront the landlord who discriminated against LB, right. telling him no one-bedroom apartments were available. I will see you at 9.30 at 2854. Thank you. I must say I'm good at this. <laughs> I spent my career creating characters whose lives would shine a light on our divided society. The point was to move beyond the divisions, but being a part of this experiment has shown me that racism still stains our country. Through subtle words and gestures that shut people of color out of neighborhoods and out of opportunity, the landlord's actions placed me on one side of the divide and LB on the other. Now I want to see how he will answer for himself. Hi. 
With a hidden camera and a producer posing as my daughter, we continue the charade as he shows us an apartment in the building. There's two windows. This is the kitchen. This is the living room. Do you remember that face? Because he came looking for an apartment just the other day, and you told him that the one bedroom where the studio was available. I don't have no one bedroom. You have one at Wellman Avenue that we were supposed to see today. I'm sorry to uh, cost you this way, but there were no blacks in the building, and we're not going to rent the blacks in the building. Come with me. Come with me. Oh. The landlord says he'll take us to meet some of his black tenants. But after we enter the building, he changes his mind and says he doesn't want to disturb them. He lied, I believe. And he represents a good deal of America. And I'm, I'm not sad because they're bad guys. I'm sad because we don't have a culture that discusses us with them and with uh, the so-called good guys. You know, we're all gonna have to know about it, think about it, talk about it before we ever get past it. I feel sadder for having done it because this is our America and it isn't what we promised. <laughs>